Hello, and welcome back to Ice World with me, Nadia Frontier, marine biologist from the British Antarctic Survey. In this podcast, we feature conversations about living and working in Antarctica. And this time, we meet two awesome field guides, Ed and Shep. As you'll hear, being a field guide is one of the most highly skilled and varied jobs in Antarctica. From accompanying scientists on expeditions and setting up camps in remote locations to fixing sledges and training staff to be competent in survival techniques. My first conversation is with Ed Luke during the winter of 2021. You may remember hearing Ed during season two, where we sailed down together on the James Clark Ross. At the time of recording, for both of us, it was our first experience in Antarctica. I began by asking Ed why he decided to come to Antarctica. Uh, why? Because it's flipping cool, isn't it? I mean, when do you get to live somewhere this beautiful for this long? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Not like that right now as you look out the window, but <laughs> blowing a gale. some of the time, you know, <laughs> it's a view that is um, beyond words. So, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd like to, yeah, I wanted to do a job that was interesting and around super cool people, happy people, friendly people. And yeah, yeah, something nice, isn't it? Something, yeah, something enjoyable. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely an inspiring view. Did you have um, any reservations before coming away for 18 months? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I'm a bit strange like that. I remember talking to my little brother and be like, oh, Rob, do you ever get the feeling you just want to, like, just disappear? And he was like, no. I was like, oh, OK, that's just me then. Just you. So, yeah. <laughs> and this is one of those jobs, isn't it? You've just disappeared. And I guess we'll resurface eventually. Right? Yeah. So we'll resurface eventually back in the real world. But, a yeah. good time A good time to go away. And it does feel like that. I feel like as time goes on more and more, I'm just losing contact with the real world yeah and especially now we're getting to the end of winter and it's just well we've had such a long time here mm. i cannot imagine it ending is this what you expected yeah i think i did my homework very well excellent yeah that's great yeah yeah i think it's quite good i think this is where this job is quite interesting in that if you have a fairly good comprehension of what you're walking into or what you're signing up for what you're doing or what you're going to be doing then I think it's it's okay. I think maybe some of the team weren't too sure what yes. they were getting themselves into. So they suffered disappointment. And it's, well, just a much harder or much, you know, it's a different experience for them perhaps. Not knowing what to expect. Yeah. Do you enjoy this aspect of, in the winter, you're responsible for everyone on station and taking them out on their holiday. Do you enjoy that new aspect of teaching? Yeah, it's pretty cool. You get to share some pretty pretty cool moments with people take them out into this amazing environment and watch them faff around with their gloves and <laughs> try and tie knots and stuff and, and have cheer no them idea on what and they're doing. <laughs> encourage them through the process as they can't feel their fingers but yeah no it's, it's a good laugh as well it's quite nice the whole pyramid tent world of cooking and chilling out and reading books and yeah it's just quite a nice setup as far as camping goes i don't think you could do it much better you'd you'd be hard pressed to do camping better than we do here it's not really camping though is it it's glamping glamping. tell tell me through the camp setup what is it like when you arrive on site in this antarctic desert so you've got like your skidoo and you've got sled and what do you do yeah so the first like week or two is pretty wild because you've got you've got days there and days is telling you how how everything goes together you're like right days okay cool and it just, sort of, it just sort of piles on all this stuff and you're like, wow, so where are we going and for how long? Like, there's a lot of stuff to the point where I remember like coming back from the first trip, which was one night <laughs> <laughs> and we had to fill up the entire snow cow, which is a pretty big vehicle. And that was just full of boxes and tents. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of stuff for one night. But you get kind of accustomed to it after a while. You get acclimatized to the, the weight and the faff and <laughs> it just becomes normal. Yeah. Yeah. So like, t- what again. would you pack on your sled, for example? Take it from the bare bones of the okay, Nansen so sled. Okay, so from the bare bones, so you've got your, your Nansen sled, which like all kind of sleds that are designed to be pulled along behind skidoos are all lashed together so they can't rattle apart. So you can see the whole thing flexing as you're driving behind someone who's towing one. Uh, then you've got your board in the middle, which put you put your jerry cans on, so your twin litre jerrys. So you've got eight of them and then one caro jerry and they sit in the middle so that's like the foundation weight of it and then you've got various boxes so we've got boxes for 
food and we've got boxes for pots and we've got boxes for stoves and we try and keep them all separate so they don't contaminate or get confusing and then everything has its system so on top of all that you'll have your pee bag which is your sleeping setup shall we say per person and then your tent goes on the very top of everything so you're trying to keep the weight as low as you can and you've got your tent last thing on so it's the first thing off so you can get it up quickly and then you can weight it down with all these boxes and all these jerry cans and blocks of snow and then you've got your toilet tent because no one wants to go out to in, 50 not wins in 50 with no not wins no, God unless forbid. you really have to unless you're really you, desperate you're on a, I guess so. on a trip where you have to save weight and you can't take a toilet yeah. tent then could you, you imagine do that be awful <laughs> good and then when you actually set up the pyramid tent on site it's quite an ordeal well I found that at least the first time because you've got right. these enormous poles and they're so heavy yeah. and then you like you know, bash them into the ground and then you've got the guide ropes that you tighten at the same time but it's such a big and heavy tent and quite an operation or have you yeah. have you been in these kind of no these are before? quite unique tents they're quite expensive tents and they're very unique for this environment yeah and they're unique to this setup because it's not often in life you can go on a trip and still afford to take a 30 kilo tent or 35 kilo tent so yeah i think it stems from probably well the traditions of the fact that it's not going to fall apart in very strong winds it's not going to break and it's your office, right? It's your home and your office. So when you're actually in the field, so when you're on the continent, you could be in there for weeks on end. So it's as comfortable as it can be, given the requirements. Do you trust it when there's 50 knot winds outside, or even more? What have you had so far? Like we've well, probably got up to 70. 70. Yeah, probably. So you've got 70, 70 knot winds ripping past your tent. You're just out in the open. Do you trust the tent? Do you yeah. trust the canvas? Yeah, very. Like it's one of those things that once you've got experience with, you start growing comfortable with how well it is built and what it can withstand. So, mm. yeah, now I'm very comfortable with the the pyramid tents and what they can handle. And yeah, start personalising it. Yeah, that's really absolutely. important, isn't it? And then yeah. you've got your own tent. You know it's yours. Yeah, you do get different. you become attached to your tent. So. And how much typically does a full setup of a sled with all the contents weigh? I'm going to say 500 kilos, maybe more. That's enormous. Yeah, it's a lot of weight. And it's, it's a lot of weight quite, fuel. So you pull, you, we pull that with a skidoo. So there's a, a, you're at the front as the field guide, and then we've got the sled behind us, and then we've got an, the person who you'd take on the trip or out into the field, mm-hmm. then attached to that. So we're roped up the whole time. In case there's a crevasse, then you can rescue somebody because the knots in the rope will block right yeah so it, like yeah so bass has quite a unique set when it comes to the sledges and the link line travel so 30 meter line between the two skidoos towing a sledge each yeah yeah and the thinking is that if you were to go and disappear down a crevasse then the the sled that you're towing would kind of act as the sort of breaking point so that would stay on the surface and then the yeah and then it's not a good scene it's not a good skidoo. day it's not a good day but, but it's, it's, it's still like nothing the skidoo is putting that so long so it allows you to take so much stuff which is pretty cool yeah 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 and then you, you've got to get someone to sit on the sled because they can they can roll have you rolled nansen sledges yeah yeah we've had some pretty exciting rolls <laughs> Maybe that's not yeah really sometimes the right they, sometimes they can roll themselves back up again <laughs> uh, really yeah oh so you roll them over move on a little bit and then they write them well themselves. someone had quite a good one last week what happened there? Yeah, let's not go into too much detail. But, yeah, I mean, I think the problem is, or that I've not had to do it oh. yet, but the problem is if it goes on its side, and then you can either, if you're on a slope, you can roll it over again until it rights itself. Or sometimes you have to put the 10-meter line around it from the side and then pull it back up. Or if it comes to the worst, you have to unpack the entire sled and put it back together again. Oh, yes. that's, that's yes. worst case scenario. Yes. I can't yes. imagine that happening. Plenty of faff. <gasps> What has been your favourite winter trip? <sighs> any any trips I've done with Nadia Frontier, no. to be honest. <laughs> okay, that's a rubbish question. <laughs> <laughs> no, have you, how did you enjoy the hauling trips? Let's talk about that, because that's something we did together, which was super cool. So forget that 500 kilos of all the gear. Mm. This is like, strip it down to the bare necessities. But even the bare necessities are quite it's Still luxurious. quite heavy. Yeah, yeah, it's still, still got, got that big that tent. 35 kilo pyramid tent which yep. the poor wind trippy has to suffer carrying but then other than that we packed the sledges with just like sleeping <laughs> bags and some food and then we have a, a harness and we pull ourselves along and we're walking for 
hundreds and thousands of kilometers it's crazy isn't it no joking what do we do like 50 kilometers <laughs> it just felt like so yeah, much more maybe 50. and then you realize yeah, at the end of the day the distance is after a really hard day i think the first leg was 11 11 kilometers from yeah, leaving here to our campsite which is actually nothing in the grand scheme of things <laughs> but you've done two haul, three hauling trips Jazz yeah and like Katie. two and a half yeah two and a half hauling trips are you glad you did it (laughs) pulling a sled like your body is just so tired isn't it but it's It's quite a strange workout isn't it feeling very strange workout kind of satisfying and a cool way to move along because then you haven't got to yeah you got you can really immerse in it and you haven't got the noise of a skidoo and we can access places that you cannot access via a skidoo because it's kind of crass territory Mm -hmm. but yeah chitin so what do you do when you're in the winter time when you're not on winter trips have you got um, like routine maintenance of sledges? Yeah, and stuff we've got a lot of maintenance tasks. So, if you could imagine in the summer season, everything's super busy and everything's going crazy, and people just need things straight away. So, you don't really have time to fix stuff that you've broken or people have broken. And all the little fiddly jobs that need a base and need a nice, warm inside environment to take care of, you can't really do them in the summer. So, in the winter, then we have this lovely long list of things to do and go through and fix and stock off or change or improve on so yeah yeah it's our winter time i think it's probably it the biggest contrast for you guys actually being here on station in the winter to then going into the summer so you you're expecting to go for months in the field this summer what are your yeah so i've got quite a cool job this uh, summer season so it should be a 40 day trip two and a half thousand kilometers from sky blue down to the ellsworths myself and the scientists will be going down there with the skidoo setup that we just talked about and we're going to try and find some locations for drilling so we can get some rock samples in future years. So it's a multi-year project, but this is the reconnaissance So a preliminary trip. study to look at the sites. geological, like map out geological sites, um, rocks for Yeah, they're trying to do like a transect on a line from the westernmost point of the Ellsworths. And then there's a, a group of nanotacks and then a group of mountains so there's three sites and we need to find depths within a 600 meter range so it can't be too deep so we're going to be using uh, gpr so ground penetrating radar to find these locations optimal sites yep. for drilling yeah that's cool so just you and a scientist for 40 days yep are you looking forward to that i am or is yeah, it quite a daunting yeah. prospect no. being out with someone you don't know or, or are you quite used to that because yeah, i'm quite used to it i think it depends on the how they take to the challenge, really. Yeah. 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 It's going to be great. That's super, yeah, super yeah. cool. Yeah. So you'll have your pyramid tent with you. So will you be setting up, will you be moving along and setting up a camp at each destination? Yeah, so that's where the job that's gets reasonably physical. Yeah, so if you're moving camp every day, which is not mm-hmm. unheard of, it's quite common. And that's where the teamwork comes in and the competency of both of you working well as a team just makes life easier. Coming back to station then. Yeah. So other than all your amazing expeditions in the field and mm-hmm. climbing and doing everything, what do you enjoy on station? And have you learnt any new skills? Uh, on station. <laughs> <laughs> the pregnant the pause. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's really nice. It's really nice to get back and have the community. Like it's nice to get hugs and stuff and be around people when I get back. It's really cool. Lose at chess. Oh, I get whooped at chess every time. Yeah. Kicking, right, you've become quite a chef though. That's nah, I think I, I thought you were gonna say dessert. that as your new skill. Like what? No, you're so I just good make at baking. Cakes and stuff. Oh, it's great. Uh so yeah. No, cakes are great. Everyone loves cake. So well, it's from muffins. Certain ones go faster than others, but it's always an interesting experiment. Yeah, it's just a nice place, isn't it? Like just Lovely people, super nice views. Penguins will be back soon. You know, it's just sort of, yeah, it's yeah. pretty good. And that's field guide Ed Luke. He's currently in the Arctic in Svalbard preparing for a kiting expedition with Sasha Doyle. That is using kites that will propel you with the wind whilst being pulled along by skis and a polk. Sasha is also a field guide working with the British Antarctic Survey. Ed mentions Sky Blue which we've heard before, and is one of the British Antarctic Survey's remote airstrips, an ice runway and staging posts for deep field expeditions. 
Let's hear more about that with field guide Matthew Shepherd. He was a climbing instructor when he applied to join the British Antarctic Survey. Within just a week of arriving to Antarctica, we call him Shep, was sent to Sky Blue and a new busy routine ensued. So we got to get up in the morning, check the runway, radio, rather with what the weather's doing on the hour, every hour, until they stand you down. Wow. From 7 o'clock in the morning until whenever. And then chat to the planes when they're coming in, get on the radio to the planes when they're on finals and just give them a wind speed and a direction so they know how to land. And then, yeah, help refuel the planes and just generally keep the camp alive and flags, flag everything. Uh. Flag, flags are our world, the machines are Matty's world. <laughs> what are your living conditions? So there's melon huts out there, which are like big fiberglass red blob things. And they've got three beds in, or four beds, and like a little bench and some stoves and stuff like that. So you're like in a little pod for yeah. the month. And is it warm? How do you get your heating? Yeah, so they've got reflex stoves in them, which run on the after, which is the aircraft fuel. So we just get a drum of that and fill up the stoves every so often. And then we've also got a big weather haven, which is like a big marquee, like an insulated marquee, which also has two reflex stoves in, which keeps that warm. And that's where we do all our cooking and dry our clothes and live, and it's got a couch in there. and It's pretty cosy. Oh, cool. I've never, I've never yeah. actually seen that part. I've just seen sky blue at either end of, of closing down yeah okay but then you then support all the aircrafts that are coming in to then do deep field science yeah so that's the point of that station of sky blue yeah, yeah it's crazy so, isn't it you don't think of like the logistics of how many people need to keep something running and all the behind the scenes yeah so when i'm there i'm helping the planes get in and the whole reason the planes are there is for the science happening further south than we are mm -hmm. so yeah the planes can come in for they might just drop fuel and then fly north again to rotherham in a day or they might come down with science cargo and scientists to go further south and then they'd stop for the night and we'd have to put tents up and things for them and cook for them and things like that. Which is when the, the weather heaven's really good because they can all sit in the couch people. and be cosy and warm and then, yeah, wow. we can host people. Did you expect to be doing something like this? No, I don't think so. I don't even know why I expected. Different side of logistics. Yeah, because that's like, yeah, like you say, it's the logistics side of it. Massively. Not that's not your, that's science. Not your experience. Yeah, that's not yeah. what I do in the UK. Mm -hmm. but different. It's just different, yeah, yeah, which is super cool. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed being at Sky Blue. It was meant. And then where did you go to Sky Blue? So I came over Christmas and New Year, and then 1st or 2nd of January or something, I went over to Halley. So we went back through Sky Blue to fuel up, and then we flew to Halley, which was like a seven-hour flight, six-and-a-half hour, seven-hour flight. From Rothera all the way to Halley? No, from Sky Blue oh, to Oh, sorry, Halley. from Sky Blue to yeah. Halley, seven-and-a-half hours. So we went yeah. in a one-hour. Over... We Oh, in a one from the Wed over the Weddell Sea. And over the Weddell, over, over the Ronnie Ice Shelf. Yeah, Ronnie. Ronnie on the Brunt. And yeah, I got there to Halley from Sky Blue in Awana. And then I was there for eight, I think eight weeks I was at Halley. What was Halley? Halley's really cool. Yeah, it's an ice shelf, so it's completely different. Feels a little bit similar to Sky Blue, but not because there's no mountains. It's just flat. Totally flat. Yeah. I was there with Andy, who was showing me what to do because I was still reasonably new. Um, another field guide. Yeah. Yeah, another field guide. So he was an old wintering field guide and I was an incoming field guide. So we did a bit of handover and then we were going um, servicing science instruments, which was really cool. What, Got to drive out. what are science instruments we servicing? So they were the LOH sites. So lifetime of Halley. So they monitor how the Brunt Ice Shelf moves, which way it's going, and they've got GPS locations in that are accurate to like the millimetre. It can show how the whole ice shelf is moving and straining and doing weird things. There's a network of like 10 to 15 of them. So, so every year we've got to go out, dig the batteries up, service them as in change all the wires and make sure they're all still working, pull the SD card out, put a new one in, dig it all up, raise it all to the surface, so then when it gets buried with snow, it's still on the surface so we can find it again. Reflag it and then fill it all back in again, fill all the old hole, and then that's one done. Oh, yes, fill the old hole in. Yeah, you got to fill the old hole in. Why? So that it doesn't drift the new hole. Wow. So you go through all that effort. Yeah. Of all that effort to dig it up and then fill it back in again. Wow. And changing the wires, that's a bit like electrical, isn't it? Yeah. So, so I don't actually do any of that. So we go out. So if it was just me taking someone out, it'd be me. And then over at Halley, it was Ross, who was the electronics engineer. Um, they would and do. Ollie, who was the glaciologist. And they would do all the science stuff. So they'd do all the bits with the instrument. Mm hmm. And basically, I'd just dig a hole and get them there. And you're supporting it. Yeah. Wow, I'm big, big responsibility. So then after eight weeks, and bearing in mind, you have literally just got to Antarctica, so you're already straight into the field at Sky Blue and then at Halley, and then you come back with me yep. to Fossil Bluff. 
Yeah, we flew back and we stopped Another somewhere. outpost. 71 degrees south. Degree south. Yeah, so, yeah were... so we flew back from Halley via Sky Blue. Yes, um, waited a day. Waited a day because the weather was rubbish. So yep. the field guide at Fossil Bluff was telling us the weather was rubbish so we couldn't go. So then we were going to go to Rotherham in one go all the way back from Sky Blue. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we eventually halfway through, uh, the pilot was like, no, Ian. He was just like, no, no, we're going to go and try Fossil Bluff. And then we landed and then you guys kicked me out. Yeah. Yeah. So then. And then you were at Fossil Bluff. Yeah. So then I was at Fossil Bluff. Weeks. Uh, so this was right at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. So we were closing it down, which basically means taking everything apart because we can't leave certain things there for winter because they'll break or they need to be serviced for whatever reason. So I was just there to help with that. So I was there for, yeah, I think 10 days, something like that. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Good way to end the season. And then, yeah, it was really nice. And then back to Rotherham. And then came back to Rotherham winter. for winter, yeah. Yeah. And that was, was that the start of March, I think? Yeah. Think so then our actual winter started in May, but you began the process of winter trips, so you take out winterers yeah. into the field. So that's different again now. Yeah. You're now to a new different skill set. Yeah, so a different part of the job through winter is the winter trips. Yeah, that's just taking each person out one-to-one. So it'd be me and someone, so me and Nadia, for example. We had a rubbish week. Yeah. When we went a out. A lot of people. But, yeah, it's been a bit... Good. The weather's not been great this year, but hey-ho. Yeah, so it'd be one-to-one, and we just go out for a week camping or doing whatever the person wants. And, yeah, we have a good week and go climbing or go mountaineering or go skiing. How do you find that? Or, yeah, I think it's really good. that you live and work with, so that's different to climb. Yeah, that's different again. In the yeah. UK, it's more an experience of... Yeah, you're like taking your, fr- I guess, taking your friends out. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like taking your friends out, but, but then but you're also work. at work. So then there's the pressure again of like wanting them to have a really good time, but then you're also at work, so you can't push it too far because you're being paid to do your job, so you're not out with your friends. So it's a bit yeah, weird. Yeah, you can't. You it's can't really tricky. Which is really cool. It's really nice to like balance that and have that as because I've never had that before. So it was interesting. That's cool. But yeah, it was really good, and we've done loads. I took some people down to Carver Hall, mm. Louis down there. That was cool. So that was a week. So that's uh, about a hundred k drive over a day, and then you camp, and then it's another twenty or thirty k to Carver Hall, and then you come all the way back again. So that's really cool. So that's on the west side of the island. Yeah. Uh, where else have we been? Been to Trident. Yeah, been everywhere. It's been cool. Driving, yeah. driving yeah. anywhere you can go on a skidoo, basically. And get to see the sights pretty well. Yeah. How have you found the winter experience, would you say? Now we're towards the end of it. How did you cope with the darkness and long periods of not being able to go outside properly? I didn't think the dark was that bad. It was dark and like now we're out the other side. I was definitely like, oh, maybe I was a bit grumpy <laughs> and like I was a bit tired. But I didn't at the time. I was like, ah, it's not that bad. Like you do still get... Incremental change. You still, yeah, because it's so gradual going into it, so gradual coming out of it. You kind of don't notice. Mm. And like there is some daytime, so as long as you make the most of that little bit of twilighty brightness. Just at lunchtime. Just yeah, at lunchtime. Like try and get outside for Yeah, a walk just go and do something. Go for a ski. Then you're kind of alright. And if you can keep yourself active. So I did loads of stuff, just keeping myself busy and Fuchs in the evening and things like that. Yeah. You kinda of don't notice. Yeah, you're really good. You're very motivated yeah. and, and doing a lot of climbing. And, and because we were on winter trips on the start of winter and the end of winter. Mm. The bit in midwinter was broken up with us on nights. So I had to do my weeks of nights, one of those weeks, the four weeks in midwinter. It's a whole week of night shift, yeah. So that broke it up because I had a bit of dark and then, well, it was always going to be dark because it was night time. And then that was fine because I was expecting it. And then it was a bit more dark and then it was back to being, getting sunnier again. Mm, and going back on so trips. Like, yeah, it kind of broke it up a bit, which was really nice. So you've got something to look forward to yeah. as well. It's and I actually really like nights. Structure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't cool. have to see anyone. <laughs> yeah, I did see people, but yeah, you can just do your own thing. It's like a different change, like a change yeah. of pace of like, it was like, oh, I'm on nights. Like, I've just got to walk around and check stuff isn't on fire. It's pretty cool. It's pretty important. <laughs> it's pretty important, yeah, but yeah. it's different. It's like something new. Yeah, which is, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel stimulated by this job and would you recommend it to somebody? Uh, Yeah, definitely. I think it's different to what I expected. Yeah. But I think if I'd have been told beforehand that this is what it was then it wouldn't have changed me coming down because i think as a field guide i would think oh you're outside all the time climbing mountains but the reality is that a massive part of your job yeah. is the logistics of support and science and yeah in the winter you get more of that what you're used to like taking people out climbing on routes but yeah so some, when, the summers either side are heavily logistic based yeah so what we're when we apply important. we apply for 
helping science teams. So the idea is that we're guiding science teams around in deep field. So that's what we're told we'd be doing in summer. And then the winter's kind of left to the wayside for a bit until you actually like are in the job and you know what's happening. And then you're like, oh, we're going to go and take people out and do stuff during winter as well. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But then in reality in summer, you end up doing quite a lot of the logistics just because that is needed to support the science. But you're not necessarily told that at the start, which is fine because it's not like overly stressful, complicated work. It's just... It's just managing expectations. Yeah, it's just managing... Exactly, yeah. But then, even if I knew that, I don't think it would change me coming down because it still means I get a see Antarctica and do cool stuff. Yeah, and I I quite like the idea of your job being so varied. You get to do so many different... Yeah, it is really varied. You you move around a lot and your role actually massively does change. Yeah, we're not doing the same thing every week, week in, week out for 18 months. Mm. It's definitely different. Now we're getting to the end of winter, I'm starting to think like, oh, I'm in summer... I'm going doing this and then that's like its own thing like yeah. Hallie was its own thing it's like a separate entity yeah, yeah and then amazing. here was a separate thing and now that's a separate thing as well it's like breaks it up yeah very which is super nice in, in yeah. 18 months I think you've managed to achieve a lot what what are you doing this summer I'm on the ghost traverse this summer so that's a seismic project on the lower throats last year and we're gonna go and yeah do some seismics which involves putting dynamite in some holes and blowing it up and measuring it and seeing how much the ice sheet vibrates to find out how thick it is, basically. Because it's one of the fastest receding things in Antarctica. It is. Which is pretty cool. Wow. So I'm once I leave here in summer, if it all goes to plan, I'll go from here to Sky Blue and then drive from Sky Blue to the Thwaites Glacier. How long will that take? Uh, it's going to take us two weeks, I think, just to get there. And then from there, we'll get there mid-November and then we'll spend all of the rest of November setting up and then december and january i'll be spent doing seismics yeah and then at the end of january we need to be back at waste divide which is the american version of sky blue that's their like southern outpost. outpost yeah and then from there we'll winterize all the kit so we'll winterize all the piston bully machines because that's what you're using to get to the glacier piston yeah bullies. so we're driving around on piston bullies and okay. the skidoos so some of the skidoos are coming from here and then yeah once we're at waste we'll then fly to mcmurdo which is the americans yeah and then from McMurdo, we're going out through the other side of Antarctica, through New Zealand. That's good. So I've done round the bottom of the world, which is Amazing. pretty cool. Amazing. That, I think you've got a really, yeah. a really good So if all goes to plan, wow. that should be the... Yeah, that should happen. Cool. So I won't see here you once won't... I leave. Yep. Which is pretty weird. But so yeah, that, that makes it its own place. little thing. Yeah. Which is really cool. That's going to be a great experience. How many people will be on the traverse? So there's Three two months. different traverses. There's the traverse that we are all drive from Sky Blue, which yep. is four machines. And there'll be two per machine, so the eight of us. Mm-hmm. We'll then split up. So three machines will be on the science ghost traverse. Yeah. And then there's the single PB that's the ops traverse. So they're going to help fuel all the other science projects. So they're going to drive around and do all that. I'm not part of that. <laughs> but then when it's the science project, everyone else is flying in through New Zealand. So they'll come in through the Americans. And then I think there's 27 of us in total with three PBs. That's enormous. Yeah, it's really big. Is that 27 scientists or is there quite a lot of 27 people? people in total. Yeah. So there's three field guides, one traverse leader. There's like a GA, like a general assistant mm-hmm. cook type person. And then three mechanics and then the rest are scientists. So I think it's seven ops. Three, yeah, three mechs, three fieldies, traverse leader, GA. Eight. eight. Yeah. Eight and then 19 scientists. That's enormous. Yeah, it's big. So we're basically going to put on a poly sled, which is a big bit of plastic. Yeah. They're going to fly some chippies in and they're going to build a weather haven on the back of a sledge. So instead of having to put the tent up every time you stop, you're it's just going to drag a fully built, like heated tent around with you all the time. So then you've always got somewhere to go, which wow. is pretty mad, which is what that it's two weeks of setup is for when we yeah. get to Waze because we need to build a tent on the back of a sledge. And will you be involved in that building? Uh, I don't think so, but I'm going to be there at the time. So I don't know how useful I'll be. I'll probably end up doing weathers and things like that. Yeah. Because I don't have and the skills to do that. Will you be in a, in a safe area when you set up? Like, how do you know there's no, no crevasses around you? So in front of us, that I'm not part of, um, if you know Julie, Julie's yeah. coming down, they're going to go in front with the GPR radar, and they're going to GPR the whole route that we drive, which is a ground-penetrating ground radar. Ground-penetrating radar, yeah. And they'll look for crevasses 
or any sort of problems under the ice that we can't see. Yeah. Check that it's safe for us to drive on it. And then we'll follow down on more skidoos and the machines and drive around. Wow. So they're the radar team and we're the seismics team. Mm-hmm. So they're part of that 27. So but we might not actually see them because that's four of them that we might actually see because yeah. they're independent from us. Okay, and they'll be ahead. So that's yeah. ensuring your safety. Insane. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. Wow. I mean, yeah. it's crazy just it to, uh, cool. to obtain data, the amount of people that are needed to ensure that obtention. And also it becomes your life. Like, it's not a nine-to-five job. You're literally yeah. living on that traverse for months to gain data about movements in the ice sheet. Yeah, so you you see it from a really scientific background of like, this is the data we need. And then you're like, whoa, that's like really crazy to make that happen. Whereas yeah. doing stuff in that place just seems really normal to have that many people. And then yeah. the science is like an add-on. Like if you want to go there, you need all this stuff. And then the science is the whole reason you're going there. So mm-hmm. then you need even more stuff. So it's just a big logistics problem of how to get all that stuff and fuel and food and people and all that how do you get it to there the most most southerly yeah isolated inaccessible place this random this random ice sheet in the middle of antarctica (laughs) how do we get all this kit there to make this possible it's my blown. so that's how i see it so i'm like well how would you do that how do you get all these people because it's it's a global effort because it's two countries and flying in through new zealand and flying through here and there's people from all over just to go and get some numbers. <laughs> They're super so important. They're like super that. important numbers, but like, yeah, I'm a climber. Like, I don't really, you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you but mean. But you see so it from it, the other side, which is super cool. Right, so from like the side. That's dumbing it down a lot, but. No, but it's interesting. I think yeah. it's really good to give people in the future also a bit of an idea of actually what the work is like, because it can be easy to think that these British Antarctic bases, they're purely driven by scientists. Yeah. And that's often how it gets reported in the media. It's like, oh, the scientists at the research stations. But it's actually, the reality is that for each scientist and each science project, you need a massive number of logistical yeah. people to yeah. ensure that. So really, it's more like a, it's a global effort. And that's what I want to emphasise in this podcast, that there are so many people here that are supporting the science. And that's not necessarily your background and your your interest and you're not going to be looking at the data and necessarily reading the papers. Yeah. You're supporting that and that's your job. What do you take away from Antarctica, Shep? What will you take away? When you what leave? will I take away? Uh, that the people are awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. I think that's everybody cool. I've met down here has been the nicest person in the world. Everybody. Everybody's super nice and super friendly and super helpful. And like, it's just really nice to be part of it. Whether that's part of being wintering and like everyone's getting on and like everyone's A really friends. tight community. Yeah, it's really cool to be part of. I don't know. But yeah, what was the question? <laughs> what, what do you take away? What do you take away from take this away? experience? Just be part of stuff. Like, it's cool, isn't it? Like, normally I just teach people rock climbing and, like, it's nice to see them progress, progress and do stuff, yeah. yeah. But it's, like, pretty small and pretty insignificant. Like, it doesn't really matter if people it's not learn like to rock climb. Like, it's not the end of... Yeah, it's yeah. not really that important, is it, really, in the grand scheme of things? Interesting. Whereas, like, this kind of is, you are actually helping stuff happen further south and the things that are happening down there do matter in the real world. International science Yeah, they are big science projects about climate change and things like that that are like actually important things, not me going rock climbing in England somewhere. <laughs> like I it's pretty it. cool no, to be I part of. It. It's really it is really nice. That's great. Does that answer your question? That does answer my question. Thanks, <laughs> it's been really good talking to you. Yeah, it's been cool. Very honest insight. I like it. Yeah. Thanks. I, yeah, you're welcome. So that's Matthew Shepherd aka Shep, Antarctic field guide and currently back in the UK teaching and guiding in England and Wales. He has aspirations to become a long-term guide. I should explain what a piston bully is because it is quite an odd name. These are large tracked red vehicles which you might have been seen being used as snow groomers on ski resorts. I hope that these conversations have given you a sense of the complex logistics involved in living and working in Antarctica. If you do fancy Shep or Ed's job, then check out the job section of the British Antarctic Survey's website. The current post for field guides is now live and the deadline is at the end of March. Do consider subscribing or writing a review for the Ice World podcast if you liked it. It really helps us build the audience. I'm Nadia Frontier, and thank you very much for tuning in to this episode. See you next time. <laughs>